Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. Disclosures for this podcast are listed on the podcast page. Hello and welcome to this episode of the ASCO Education Podcast. Today, we'll explore how we interpret and integrate recently reported clinical research into practice, focusing on two clinical scenarios, localized prostate cancer progressing to hormone-sensitive metastatic disease and a case of de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer progressing to castration-resistant disease. My name is Kriti Mittal, and I am the Medical Director of GU Oncology at the University of Massachusetts. I am delighted to co-host today's discussion with my colleague, Dr. Jorge Garcia. Dr. Garcia is a professor of medicine and urology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He is also the George and Edith Richmond Distinguished Scientist Chair and the current chair of the Solid Tumor Oncology Division at University Hospital's Seidman Cancer Center. Let me begin by presenting the first patient scenario. Case 1. A 72-year-old male was referred to urology for evaluation of hematuria. A rectal exam revealed an enlarged prostate without any nodules. A CT urogram was performed that revealed an enlarged prostate with bladder trabeculations. A cystoscopy revealed no stones or tumors in the bladder, but the prostatic urethra appeared to be abnormal looking. Transurethral resection of the prostate was performed. The pathology revealed Gleason score 4 plus 5, 9 prostate cancer involving 90% of the submitted tissue. PSA was performed one week later and was elevated at 50. Patient declined the option of radical prostatectomy and was referred to radiation and medical oncology. So I guess the question at this point is, Dr. Garcia, in 2023, how do you stage patients with high-risk localized prostate cancer and how would you approach this case? That's a great question and a great case, by the way, sort of what you and I in our practice will call bread and butter. Patients like this type of case that you just presented come from different places to our practice, right? So either they come through urology or oftentimes they may come to radiation oncology. And certainly, you know, it depends where you practice in the United States and ex-US, they may come through medical oncology. So I think that the first question that I have is in whatever role I'm playing in this case where the patient has seen a urologist or a radonc or me first, I think it's important for us in medical oncology, at least in the prostate cancer space, to talk about how do we think of their case and put those comments into context for the patient. It's very simple for you to tell a patient you can probably have surgery, radiation therapy, but at the end of the day, how do you counsel that patient as to the implications of the features of his disease is going to be really important. I use very simple examples that I relate to my patients, and but really this patient is a patient that has very high risk prostate cancer based upon the NCCA guidelines and how we actually stratify patients into what we call low risk, intermediate, and high risk, and between those, very low and very high risk. So his PSA is high, very high, I would argue. His Gleason score now, what we call group grade, and is high. He has high volume disease. So the first question that I would have is, what are the choices for treatment for a patient like this? But even before you and I may talk about treatment options, we really want to understand the volume of their disease and whether or not they have localized prostate cancer with high risk features or whether or not they have locally advanced or hopefully not metastatic disease. So back in the days prior to the FDA approval for PSMA PET imaging, we probably will have a technetium 99 whole body bone scan, and ORs who probably will actually use CT scanning. Most people in the past, we used to do just a CT of the abdomen and pelvic region. As you know, with the movement of oral agents in the advanced setting, 
I think most of us will do a chest CT, abdomen, and pelvic region. And certainly, we all surprise will have a, a technician 99 bone scan. Now, with the utility and the use of PET imaging, I think most people like him will probably undergo PET PSMA, where you use uh, F18 PSMA or Gallium 68 PSMA. I think the importance depends on how you look at the approval of these two technologies. I think that PET PSMA imaging is here to stay. It's probably what most of us will use. And based upon that, we will define yet you know, the true stage of this patient. So right now, what we know is he has high-risk features. Hopefully, their disease is localized. Uh, we'll probably put the patient through an imaging technology. If you don't have access to a PET, then obviously CT and a bone scan will do. But if you do, the PET will actually help us define if the patient had disease outside of the prostate region in the pelvic area, or even if they have distant metastasis. I would agree with that approach, Dr. Garcia. I think in the United States, we've been late adopters of PSMA scans. I think this patient with high-risk localized disease, if insurance allows at our institution would get a PSMA for staging. There are still some patients where insurance companies, despite peer-to-peer -peer evaluations, are not approving PSMAs. And in those situations, the patient would benefit from conventional CTs and a bone scan. So let's say this patient had a PSMA and was found not to have any regional or distant metastases. He decided against surgery, and he is seeing you as his medical oncologist together with radiation. What would your recommendations be? Well, I think the bigger question is, do we have any data to suggest or to demonstrate that if in the absence of metastatic disease with conventional imaging or with emerging technologies such as PSMA PET, there's no evidence of distant disease, which I think you probably agree with me that would be sort of unlikely with a patient with these features not to have some form of PSMA uptake somewhere in their body. But let's assume that indeed then the PSMA PET was negative. So we're really talking about high-risk localized prostate cancer. So I don't think we can tell a patient with that radical prostatectomy would not be a standard of care. We never had a randomized trial comparing surgery against radiation therapy. This patient has already made that decision and surgery is not an option for him. If indeed, you know, has selected radiotherapy, the three bigger questions that I ask myself are, where are you going to aim the beam of that radiation therapy? What technology, dose, and fractionation you're going to use? And lastly, what sort of systemic therapy you need, if any, for that matter? Where we do have some data, maybe less controversial today in 2023 compared to the past, but I think the question is, do we do radiation to the prostate only, or do we expand the fill of that radiation to include the pelvic nodes? Secondly, do we use IMRT? Do you use proton beam or not? Again, that's a big question that I think that opens up significant discussions. But more important, in my opinion, is the term of hypofractionation. I think the field of radiation oncology has shifted away from the old standard five, seven weeks of radiation therapy to more hypofractionation. In simple terms, means a higher dose over a short period of time. And there was a concern in the past that when you give more radiation on a short period of time, toxicities or side effects would increase. And I think that there is plenty of data right now, very elegant data demonstrated that hypofractionation is not worse with regards to side effects. So I think most of us will be doing or supporting hypofractionation. And perhaps even to stretch that, the question now is of SBRT. Can we offer... SBRT to a selected group of patients with high-risk prostate cancer. And again, those are discussions that we will naturally, I assume in your practice, in your group, you probably also have along with radiation oncology. Now, the bigger question, which in my mind is really not debatable today in the United States, is the need for systemic therapy. And I think we all will go back to the old data from the European ERTC data, looking at the duration of androgen deprivation therapy. And I think most of us suggest that at the very least 24 months of androgen deprivation therapy is the standard of care for men with high-risk prostate cancer who elect to have local definitive radiation therapy as their modality of treatment. I think that whether or not it's 24 or 36, I think that the Canadian data looking at 18 months didn't hit the 
mark, but I think the radiation oncology community in the prostate cancer space probably has agreed that 24 months clinically is the right, the sort of the sweetest spot. What I think is a bit different right now is whether or not these patients need treatment intensification. And we have now very elegant data from the British group and also from the French group suggesting, in fact, that patients with very high risk prostate cancer who don't have evidence of objective metastasis may in fact benefit from ADT plus one of the novel hormonal agents, in this case, the use of an adrenal biosynthesis inhibitor such as abiraterone acetate. So I think in my probably practice, what I would counsel this patient is to probably embark on radiotherapy as local definitive therapy and also to consider 24 months of androgen deprivation therapy. But I would, based upon his Gleason score of group grading, his high volume disease in the prostate gland and his PSA, to probably consider the use of the addition of ABI in that context. That is, in fact, how this patient was offered treatment. The patient decided to proceed with radiation therapy with two years of androgen deprivation. And based on data from the multi arm stampede platform, the patient met two of the following three high-risk features, Gleason score 8 or greater, PSA 40 or greater, and clinical T3 or greater disease. He was offered two years of abiraterone therapy. Unfortunately, the patient chose to decline upfront intensification of therapy. In addition, given the diagnosis of high-risk localized prostate cancer, the patient was also referred to genetic counseling based on the current Philadelphia Consensus Conference guidelines. Germline testing should be considered in patients with high-risk localized, node-positive, or metastatic prostate cancer, regardless of their family history. In addition, patients with intermediate-risk prostate cancer who have cribiform histology should also consider germline genetic testing. Access to genetic counseling remains a challenge at several sites across the U.S., including ours. There is a growing need to educate urologists and medical oncologists to make them feel comfortable administering pretest counseling themselves and potentially ordering the test while waiting for the results and then referring patients who are found to have abnormalities for a formal genetics evaluation. In fact, the Philadelphia Consensus Conference Guideline offers a very elegant framework to help implement this workflow paradigm in clinical practice. And at our site, one of our fellows is actually using this as a research project so that patients don't have to wait months to be seen by genetics. This will have implications as we will see later in this podcast, not only for this individual patient, as we talk about the role of PARP inhibitors, but also has implications for cascade testing and preventative cancer screening in the next decade. Dr. Mittal, I think that we cannot stress enough the importance of genetic testing for these patients. Oftentimes, I think one of the challenges that our patients are facing is how they come into the system. If you come through urology, especially in the community side, what I have heard is that there are challenges trying to get to that genetic cancer, not so much because you cannot do the test, but rather the interpretation of the testing and the downstream effect as you're describing the consequences of having a positive test and how you're going to counsel that patient. If you disregard the potential of you having an active agent based upon your genomic alteration is the downstream of how your family may be impacted by a finding such as a DNA repair deficiency or something of that nature. So for us at major academic institutions, because the flow, how those patients come through us, and certainly the bigger utilization of multi-D clinics or, you know, where we actually have more proximity with radiation oncology, urology, and we actually maybe finesse those cases through the three teams more often than not, at least discuss them, then I think that's less likely to occur. But I think the bigger question is the timing of when we do testing and how we do it. So there are two ways, and I'd love to hear how you do it at your institution, because there are two ways that I can think one can do that. The low-hanging fruit is you have tissue material from the biopsy specimen. So what you do, you actually use any of the commercial platforms to do genomic or next-generation sequencing, or you can do in-house sequencing if your facility has an in-house lab that can do a testing. And that only gets you to what we call somatic testing, which is really epigenetic changes over time that are only found in abnormal cells. 
it may not tell you the entire story of that patient because you may be missing the potential of identifying a germline finding. So when you do that, do you do germline testing at the same time that you do somatic testing? Or do you start with one and then you send to genetic counseling and then they define who gets germline testing? So at our site, we start with germline genetic testing. We use either blood testing or a cheek swab assay, and we send the full 84 gene multi-gene panel. Yeah, and I think for our audience, Dr. Mita, that's great. You know, that's I don't think you and I will be too draconian deciding which platform one uses. It's just that we want to make sure that at least you test those patients. And I think the importance of this is if you look at the New England Journal paper from many years ago from Richard Data looking at the incidence of DNA repair deficiency in men with prostate cancer in North America, that was about what, around 10% or so they can live it, right? So if you were to look only for germline testing, you only will, in theory, capture around 10% of patients. But if you add somatic changes that are also impacting the DNA pathway, right, then you may add around 23, 25% of patients. So we really are talking that if we only do one type of testing, we may be missing a significant proportion of patients who still may be candidates, maybe not for family counseling if you had a somatic change, right, a germline testing, the positivity. But if you do have somatic, then you can add into that equation the potential for that patient to embark on PARP inhibitors down the road, as you stated earlier. It may not change how we think of the patient today or the treatment for that matter, but you may allow to counsel that patient differently and may allow to sequence your treatments in a different way based upon the findings that you have. So I could not stress the importance of the NCCA guidelines and the importance of doing genetic testing for pretty much the vast majority of our patients with prostate cancer. Going back to our patients, three years after completion of his therapy, the patient was noted to have a rising PSA. On surveillance testing, his PSA rose from 0.05 a few months prior to 12.2 at the time of his medical oncology appointment. He was also noted to have worsening low back pain a PSMA scan was performed that was noteworthy for innumerable, intensely PSMA-avid osseous lesions throughout his axial and appendicular skeleton. The largest lesion involved the right acetabulum and the right ischium. Multiple additional sizable lesions were seen throughout the pelvis and spine without any evidence of pathologic fractures. So the question is, what do we do next? The first question that I would have is, the patient completed ADT, right? So the patient did not have treatment intensification, but at the very least, he got at least systemic therapy based upon the URTC data. And therefore, one would predict that his outcome will have been improved compared to those patients who receive either no ATT or less time on ATT. But what I'm interested in understanding is his native PSA matters to me while he was on radiation and ADT. I would like to know if his native PSA was undetectable, that's one thing. If he was unable to achieve an undetectable PSA as a native, that would be a different thought process for me. And secondly, before I can comment, I would like to know if you have access to his testosterone level, because notably what happens to patients like this maybe is that you will drive down testosterone while you get ADT, PSA has become undetectable. Any of us could assume that the undetectability is the result of the radiation therapy, but the true benefit of the combination of radiation and ADT in that context really comes to be seen when the patient has got off the ADT, has recovered testosterone, and only when your testosterone has normalized or is not castrated, then we'll know what happens with your serologic changes. If you rise your PSA while you recover testosterone, that is one makeup of patient. But if you rise your PSA while you have a testosterone at the castrated level, that would be a different makeup of a patient. So do we have a sense as to when the patient recovered testosterone and whether or not if his PSA rose after recovery? At the time his PSA rose to 12, his testosterone was 275. Okay, perfect. You and I would call this patient castration naive or castration sensitive. I know that it's semantics. A lot of people struggle with the castration naive and castration sensitive state. What that means really to me, castration naive is not necessarily that you have not seen ADT before. It's just that your 
cancer progression is dependent of the primary fuel that is feeding prostate cancer, in this case, testosterone or dehydrotestosterone, which is the active metabolite of testosterone. So in this case, recognize that the patient had a testosterone recovery and his biochemical recurrence, which is the rising of his PSA, occur when you have recovery of testosterone, makes this patient castration sensitive. Now, the PET scan demonstrates now progression of his disease. So clearly he has a serologic progression. He has radiographic progression. I assume that the patient may have no symptoms, right, from his disease. This patient had some low back pain at the time of this visit. So I think we can conclude he has clinical progression as well. Okay. So he has the triple progression, right? Serologic, clinical, and radiographic progression. The first order of business for me would be to understand the volume of his disease and where we use the U.S. charted definition of high volume or low volume or where we use the French definition for high volume from latitude or where we use a stampede variation for definition. It does appear to me that this patient does have high volume disease. Why? If you follow the French, as a glycine score of eight or greater more than three bone metastases and the presence of visceral disease, and you need to have two out of the three. If you follow charted definition, we did not use glycine score in the U.S. definition. We only use either the presence of visceral metastases or the presence of more than four bone lesions, two of which had to be outside the appendicular skeleton. So if we were to follow either or, this patient would be high volume in nature. So the standard of care for someone with metastatic disease, regardless of volume, is treatment intensification, is you suppress testosterone with androgen deprivation therapy. And in this case, uh, I'd love to hear how you do it in Massachusetts, but here, for the most part, I would actually use an GNRH agonist-based approach, any of the agents that we form, we have. Having said that, I think there is a role to do GNRH antagonist-based therapy, in this case, Degarelix or the oral GnRH antagonist, Relugolix, is easier to get patients on a three-month injections or six-month injections with GnRH agonists than what it is on a monthly basis. But I think it's also fair for the, our audience to realize that there is data suggesting that perhaps Degarelix can render testosterone at a lower level, meaning that you can castrate even further or have very low levels of testosterone contrary to GnRH agonist-based approaches. And also, for patients maybe like this patient that you're describing, you can minimize the flare that possibly you could get with a GnRH agonist by transiently raising the HT before the hypothalamic pituitary axis would shut it down. So either or would be fine with me. Relugolix, as you know, the attraction of Relugolix for us right now, based upon the HERO data, is that you may have possibly less cardiovascular side effects. My rational not to use a lot of relugolics when I need treatment intensification is quite simple. I'm not aware. I don't know if you can mitigate or minimize that potential cardiovascular benefit by adding ABI or adding one of the ARIs because ARIs and ABI by themselves also have cardiovascular side effects. But either or would be fine with me. The goal of the game is to suppress your male hormone. But very important is that regardless of volume, high or low, every patient with metastatic disease requires treatment intensification. You can do an adrenal biosynthesis inhibitor, such as abiraterone acetate. You can pick an androgen receptor inhibitor, such as apalutamide or ensalutamide, right, if that's the case. The subtleties in how people feel comfortable using these agents, I think None of us, as you know, Dr. Mittal, can comment that one oral agent is better than the other one. Independently, each of these three oral agents have randomized level one phase three data demonstrating survival improvement when you do treatment intensification with each respective agent. But we don't have, obviously, head-to-head -head data looking at this. What I think is different right now, as you know, is the data with the RSNs data which was a randomized phase three trial and international effort looking at triple therapy, and that is male hormone suppression plus docetaxel-based chemotherapy against testosterone suppression plus docetaxel-based chemotherapy 
plus the novel androgen receptor inhibitor known as darolutamide. This trial demonstrated an outcome improvement, survival improvement when you do triple therapy for those high volume patients. And therefore, what I can tell you in my personal opinion, that when I define uh, a patient of mine who is in need of chemotherapy, then the standard of care in my practice will be triple therapy. So if I know you are a candidate for chemotherapy, however I make that decision, that I want you to get on docetaxel at front, if you have high volume features, then the standard of care would not be ADT and chemo alone, would be ADT, chemo, and darolutamide. What I don't know and what we don't know, as you know, is whether or not triple therapy for a high volume patient is better, the same equivalent or less than giving someone ADT plus a novel hormonal agent. That is the data that we don't have. There are some meta-analysis looking at the data, but I can tell you that at the very least, if you prefer chemo, it should be triple therapy. If you prefer an oral agent, it certainly should be either apalutamide, abiraterone acetate, and or enselutamide. But you know, either or patients do need treatment intensification. And what is perplexing to me, and I know for you as well, is that a significant proportion of our patients in North America are still not getting treatment intensification, which is really suboptimal and superstandard for our practices. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for a terrific discussion on the application of recent advances in prostate cancer to clinical practice. In an upcoming podcast, we will continue that discussion exploring management of de novo metastatic prostate cancer. The ASCO Education Podcast is where we explore topics ranging from implementing new cancer treatments and improving patient care to oncologists' well-being and professional development. If you have an idea for a topic or a guest you'd like to see on the ASCO Education Podcast, please email us at education at asco.org. To stay up to date with the latest episodes and explore other educational content, please visit education.asco.org. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.